Welcome to another episode of The Cartoon Curator. On this episode, I am going to delve into a studio that has unfortunately been forgotten in the annals of time by the general public. A studio that once housed a multitude of productions in its day. The studio that I speak of is none other than Van Buren Productions. So, how did the studio come about and what led to its creation? We will also look into the man and the people behind the studio itself. A man who wouldn't be like the others before him in that he had done so much to only end up with little. As well, we will look into the studio taking over a character that is quite important to animation itself. So, as I always ponder, what is Van Buren's relevancy and legacy today in the world of animation? These questions and more will be answered today on this episode of the Cartoon Curie. The year is 1879, a year that wouldn't bear much importance outside of women's rights being established in a huge way in lieu of women being allowed to be attorneys in practice, and the first black man being allowed to play baseball, mainly infield. This man was William White, by the way. Also, believe it or not, Gilmore Garden would be opened in New York City that year, four years after it was being built. Today. It's better known as the original Madison Square Garden. This is due to it being demolished, rebuilt, and moved to the location that we all know today. Speaking of New York, our story takes place there. Well, not New York City per se, but outside of Manhattan. New York State. There, it was a whole different ball game. Life was more easygoing than life in the city. Many had lived below their means, but always managed to get by. Places like Albany, Utica, and Carmel were great places to prosper. Speaking of the latter, one particular man would set up shop there. His name would be Amity Vigno. Amity was unlike a lot of people in Carmel. See, Amity was an ambitious man out of France, Bordeaux to be exact. He was like many of the day, seeking the American dream. So, he jumped on a boat and headed to New York City. Life would eventually bring him to upstate New York. There, he would set up his venture to make an import wine that would, in time, become a family business. He would birth a son by the name of Alfred Vignon, with his wife, Marie. Long story short, Alfred would meet a woman by the name of Marietta Ferguson. They would get hitched and would birth four children, their first being Amity James Vigno. Yes, after his grandfather. Amity would actually grow up in a life of prestige, but despite that, he actually worked as a kid at his dad's livery and grocery businesses. But in 1894, tragedy would strike. His father would pass away and Amity along with his mother were left without a father and husband respectively. This wouldn't last long because Marietta would tickle the fancy of another man four years later by the name of Alfred Van Buren. Quite odd, her new husband was also named Alfred. Guess she had a thing for men named Alfred. 
oh well. This Alfred was quite a unique man, indeed. He had been in the outdoor advertising business since childhood, setting up posters and advertisements and the like, albeit to the displeasure of some. Nevertheless, he managed to carve out a place for himself, but Alfred Van Buren was a very, very shrewd businessman, to say the least, to a point where he was ruthless. He would try to dismantle any competition that tried to compete with his company. He even had a gang of his own who handled certain business that involved severe tactics. If you know what I mean. Meanwhile, Amity was a college student at the time, and he would be quite enamored by his stepfather's business acumen. Alfred was making moves that solidified him in the business world, including joining up with his rival, the New York Bill Posting Company. He would nearly own the whole company by 1905. Alfred would assume the title of chairman, while an associate by the name of Barney Link would become general manager. Alfred knew that someday he would have to give the company to the family to continue. The answer lied in Amity James Vigno, who would now be known as Amity Van Buren. Here we go. Here's our man. What was next for Amity? Well, with the knowledge that he had gained from his stepfather over the years, working alongside his biological father and his college education, Amity was primed to utilize what he had learned. Alfred would be proud of his stepson and knew he could leave everything to him. 1909 would see the passing of Alfred, unfortunately, and this would cause Amity to lose some focus. But one man would tie him to a destiny that would make him one of the biggest figures in entertainment. Amity wanted to make a mark and take the next step with Dr. Harry Kelton, a man who frequently requested work through his company. Don't let that doctor title fool you in the slightest. He was way more than that. See, he was actually a sports promoter and ran many amusement centers throughout New York City. In fact, in 1912, their partnership would be fully underway. Amity and Harry Kelton would establish the Noltec Amusement Company. Kelton spelled backwards if you are curious to know. By 1914, Amity had expanded his horizon so much that he would actually resign from the Van Buren and New York Bill Posting Company. Kelton and Amity would branch off with outdoor sports and film exhibition respectively. As 1918 rolled around, Amity had a plan. He wanted to become more than a film exhibitor. He wanted to become a distributor as he believed in giving the public the best content himself. So, he would follow in the footsteps of a man we briefly discussed in the history of Felix the Cat episode. Watch it. It would be none other than Adolf Zucker. As we know, he would go on to form Paramount Pictures. Amity would do this with his own established company, VBK Productions. On top of that, he would also align himself with Benjamin F. Keefe and Edward F. Albee, who were a dime museum owner and a circus promoter, respectively. These two men were quite the dynamos in their heyday. For instance, they both had the entire entertainment industry in the palm of their hands as they determined on how everything was booked, how people were unionized, etc. Well, it would be more Albie's doing. His tactics were so harsh, it would make a mobster blush. To make matters even more difficult, Keith would actually pass in 1914 and his son after him. So Albie would be the sole owner of the company that him and Keith made. The first order of the day, have Amity team up with Paith to make topics of the day. 
which were essentially newsreels. That would be in 1919, by the way. Anyway, Amity and Zucker would partner up to release the Mr. and Mrs. Drew's series of comedic shorts, which were mostly known as polite shorts at the time. This would be quite the investment because at the time, Sidney Drew would be very successful on stage worldwide, along with his wife, Gladys Rankin. In 1911, they were already becoming early film stars in their own right, as they would appear in several one-reel comedies with the Calum Company. Well, technically Gladys would sit out on appearing in the shorts herself, instead opting to have different actresses fill in for her, as she would take on the writing duties. But it wouldn't be without its hardships. First off, Gladys would pass away on January 9th, 1914. But that wouldn't stop Sidney for too long. He would remarry in July of that same year to Lucille McVeigh. This would be the Mr. and Mrs. Drew combo Amity would acquire by 1918. Nevertheless, the success the newly formed duo had made Amity want to invest in him. In fact, he had a lot riding on them, to a point where he gave them the flexibility to create two real comedies with an extra week added. Secondly, Amity's credo to filmmaking was uncanny at the time. He believed that money was no expense. Technically, this wouldn't be a smart choice, especially on his part. Why? Well, we will save that part for later. But with this situation here, he had every right to put all of his effort into the Mr. and Mrs. Drew shorts. He would make himself heard by doing an interview with Motion Picture News where he stated on which direction he wanted his company to go in. Amity felt that having the Drews on board would get him the type of notoriety that he seeked and finally be in a place among his peers in the business. Let's just say that with this credo that he had laid down in this interview, he was willing to go the extra mile and give everything he had to keep the Drews on board. A whole lot. The Drews would take full advantage of that credo as the budget for the shorts climbed significantly during the time of their inception. The first of the shorts would be Romance in Rings, which has Henry forgetting to bring his wedding ring to his own wedding and ask his friend to let him his wife's wedding ring. What the plot on this one? But nevertheless, it was an instant success. This would be followed by The Amateur Liar, Harold, Last of the Saxons, and Squared. The latter would be followed by a major setback, unfortunately. On April 9th, 1919, Sidney Drew would pass away at the age of 55 due to illness. This sent Lucille into despair, and she mourned excessively. Not only that, she had to find a way to continue on. She would make an attempt to do so with the next short, Bunkered. This time, Lucille would be joined by Donald McBride, who had success as a character actor in films such as Room Service. He would play her brother Jimmy. This would be followed by a sisterly scheme in August of that same year. But despite the completion of these shorts, it just wasn't the same. Lucille actually went to quit acting altogether at that point, and Amity had seen her decline. So he decided to seek out a new star, and being sued by her in the New York Supreme Court certainly didn't help matters as well. This time, it would be another character actor by the name of Ernest Truex. So, who is Ernest Truex? Well, for one, he would get his start at the very early age in theater, at the age of five. And by nine, he was touring and doing shows. Ernest would be quite the talent. It wasn't long until he would be a star on the silver screen, 
as he would start in his very first film, Caprice, in 1913. But the stage is where his biggest success would be. Amity would approach him at the height of his stage stardom and wanted him alongside Famous Players Lasky Corporation, which we know by now is Paramount Pictures. He would claim in a press release that he was continuing with what he did with Mr. and Mrs. Drew and make quality films with quality talent because he believed that they were a stable in America. Amity had huge faith in Ernest Truex as he was his ticket to making VBK Productions or AVB Corporation. See, he would also start up another company. This would be due to Kelton not being in the film business by name. K in the production's title stood for Kelton, by the way. Things would kick off for Amity and Paramount with their first post Mr. and Mrs. Drew outing. Notice I said that. That's because this would be the final screenplay that Lucille would write before her contractual obligation was up. The first film would be Night of the Dub. It would have Ernest starring as a Wall Street clerk who tries to put on a front for his friends and family by posing as a head of finance. It would release on January 25th, 1920, and it would be an instant hit on that day. Amity had struck gold as critics and audiences loved it. Not waiting to strike while the iron is hot, Amity pushed for a second film, Too Good to Be True. This one would have Ernest playing a film fanatic who is enamored by a vixen named Vera, and he invites her to a gathering of sorts. The audience and critics would once again fall in love with Truex comedic stylings. So this would warrant a third film, right? Well, not quite. See, things would fall through the cracks as Amity would get into another legal battle with the man that would broker the deal with famous players Lasky for the true ex shorts, Harry Fields. He would sue Amity for compensation that was promised to him. In other words, he owed that man money and Amity didn't pay supposedly. This in turn made famous Lasky cut ties with Amity. But this wouldn't stop him. He would link up with Paith. He would continue on with doing the shorts with Truex. The first out of the gate would be 1921's Little But Oh My. The short would be another success for Amity and Paith. Truex's success on the stage would also have a part in it as he would get rave reviews for his performance in a comedic stage spectacle Six Cylinder Love that same year. They would follow it up with Stick Around a month later. This film would also be another hit for Amity's operation and resonate with Oasis as well. But the third short, 1922's The Bashful Lover, wouldn't bode well with critics and Oasis alike. The failed reception wouldn't be the only blow to Amity. See, Pave would discontinue the shorts after only three entries. Amity had decided to stay away from producing live shorts for a while. But there was another medium that was gaining full steam around 1922. You guessed it, animation. Being the man that Amity was, he knew an opportunity when he had seen it. Little did he know, a burgeoning talent, hungry to make an impression on the industry would take the company to a new level. The year was 1922 and Amity's most precious property would be discontinued. Amity needed something to attach his studio to, something that would catch audiences again. His prayers would be answered in a studio that was making waves around 1921. This studio would be Fables Pictures Incorporated, and it would house a burgeoning talent by the name of Paul Terry. Now, 
Who is Paul Terry? Well, this is where everything starts to get interesting. See, Paul was unlike any in the business at the time. Paul would actually get his start as a photographer and a reporter for the San Francisco Bulletin at the right age of 17. That's right, 17 years old. This was due to him actually quitting school. Luckily, Paul was actually quite talented at his job. In fact, he would be the first photographer to actually photograph the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Mind you, this was all before the age of 21 that he accomplished this. But Paul actually had another love, cartooning. See, before he ever thought about picking up a camera, he studied art at his high school in San Francisco. Well, studying art would be a stretch. See, Paul was quite gifted in that as well. He would teach himself how to draw mostly at a very early age. And having a mother who was already an artist herself, a sculptor to be exact, also helped in terms of talent. Paul would actually draw cartoons for the San Francisco Bulletin frequently, and it would be a mainstay due to the great reception his art had gotten. So, in 1911, Paul left for green pastures, but we can call it New York City. Here, he would work for the Evening Sun and his own comic strip there. But it would be in 1914 where Paul would get an inspiration that would change his future here on out. This would come in the form of Girthy the Dinosaur. Yes, that dinosaur again. Paul had seen it when he, among others, were invited by Windsor McKay himself to view the film. He was amazed by what he had seen that night. Right there, he knew that he wanted to become an animator. The power of that dino, I tell you. Anyway, Paul would quickly go through the process of being an animator. And the results of his effort? It would be his first cartoon short, 1915's Little Herman. Getting his first film off the ground would be met with some hardship, though. Terry would try to sell his film off to Louis J. Selnick, but he wanted to pay Paul way less than it cost for him to make it. The reason? Well, supposedly he had told him that the stock had been more valuable before he drew on it. Wow. Okay. Despite Selnick's foul arrogance, Paul's effort would be solidified because Little Herman would be eventually purchased by Fanhouse Film Company that same year. This only further made Paul want to do more, so he would do just that with his second effort down on the phony farm. Things were going good for Paul, and it would get even better when he would be approached by Margaret Bray. Now, who is Margaret Bray? Well, We'd know her by association. In other words, she was the wife of Rudolph Bray. So, what was the reason for her approach? Well, the stock Paul had used to create Lou Herman was actually from Bray Studios. She made Paul an offer that he couldn't refuse. Either pay for the stock that he had used or sign with them. It's easy to say which choice that he took. Besides, this would be an amazing move for him. This was Bray Studios, ran by the man who created cell animation and the peg system. Bray Studios were the talk of the animation space in its early days. To be recruited with only two shorts under his belt, Paul found himself blessed by the opportunity granted to him. He would soon get to work with Bray the following year and create his very first cartoon at the studio, 1916's Farmer Alfalfa Sees New York. This would star a character personally created by Paul himself, about a farmer, of course, but not any old farmer, no. This farmer was sometimes smart 
and other times foolish. This short was about Alfalfa going into the city and soon getting conned by a bunch of swindlers. But Alfalfa, along with his pup that he had in his bag, by the way, he would turn the tables by duping them in a game of poker. The short would be a moderate success for Bray Studios, and they would continue on with more Alfalfa shorts until late that year as he would go on his own path. His time at Bray Studios would educate him on how to run a studio, so Paul wanted to take a crack at it. He did just that and took his alfalfa character along with him. Don't worry, as we mostly know by now, Bray Studios would be in a great place throughout the 1920s. Anyway, Paul would form Paul Terry Productions in 1917. It seemed Paul was on the right track, but as we mentioned before, 1917 was an important year in history. This would be a year at the tail end of World War I. Just like Otto Mesmer, he would also participate in the war. After the war ended, Paul wanted to get back to why he had started. He had produced nine shorts before the war had started, so he was on a roll. This would be around 1918, and animation space was already flourishing as you may know by now. He would actually partner up to Frank Moser, who was Paul's business partner, Er Heard, yes him, Leighton Bud, and Hugh Shields to produce more alfalfa shorts. But this was something of an offshoot. The real venture came in 1921. This is where we reach to the apex. In other words, the start of Fables Pictures Incorporated. This partnership would be a collaboration with Amity Van Buren and their first project would be Aesop Fables. This would come about when an actor producer by the name of Howard Estabrook approached him about making cartoons based upon Aesop Fables. So they would both establish the studio. Oh, one thing to say about Paul Terry was that he was quite efficient in terms of animating. He was widely known for using techniques that saved time and lessened strenuous hard work, such as redrawing only limbs of the characters on cell while keeping the body on one cell. Very streamlined. With Aesop Fables, he believed that he could make one cartoon a week. As you might know by now, watching the series, you know how hard the animation process was back then. Considering every studio at the time were using different techniques from one another. Still, Paul put all his eggs in the basket. So much that he actually sacrificed the cut of his salary to pump out shorts. They would get the ball rolling with their first outing for the Aesop Fable series with 1921's The Goose That Laid the Golden Egg. This would be quite the take on the classic fable. In fact, this would be an example of how Terry handled the fables. They would be very light adaptions of the actual fables to a point where they would touch on modern topics in disguise. Nevertheless, the fables were an instant success for everyone involved, such as Paith, of course, Keith Albee's chains of theaters, and especially Amity, since he just sat back and reaped the benefits. They wanted to keep the gravy train rolling, so they would extend the original contract to another two years. This would bring audiences short such as 1922's The Spin Thrift. But as the years went by, the shorts started to stray away from actual fables and lean more on animal characters and farmer alfalfa. Even the quotes at the end of the cartoons were dialed back in favor of humorous ones. Even though the cartoons continued to be a success, Many other animation studios were doing much better at the time, such as Pat Sullivan Studios and Bray Studios. Paul, Paul's assembly line output of the cartoons deeply affected the content. This was due to Paul's cartoons not really having a bona fide cartoon star. And you have to remember, this would be the mid-20s, and Felix the Cat was reigning supreme around this time. But this was the least of Paul Terry's problems. See, 
the company would get sued by Bray Heard over the use of the animation process. Luckily, Amity would settle matters by securing a license to use the process and giving them credit on screen. But the real trouble would come in 1929, where Amity and Paul would have a disagreement in how the cartoons were being handled. As you may know by now watching the series, another advent in animation was making waves. Synchronized sound. Amity had insisted that the cartoons make the jump to synchronized sound. But Paul didn't like the idea one bit. He believed that silent was the way to go. And he didn't want to embrace the change. Let's just say that by the end of 1928, Paul would be on the wrong side of the conversation. Nevertheless, they would release their first sound short under the now dubbed Aesop Sound Fables. That short would be 1928's Dinner Time. And of course, it would star Paul Terry's go to character, Farmer Alfalfa. Audiences and critics would take a liking to it. Despite the reception it had gotten, though, Paul was still unsatisfied with Sick and Nice Sound. To a point where he told his co-animator Frank Moser that he was going to make the cartoons the way that he wanted to make them. Silent. So the five shorts that preceded, including Stay Struck, would use non-synchronized sound. Guess who wasn't pleased that he didn't use synchronized sound? Amity, of course. So much that he just had enough of Paul Terry and openly fired him on the spot. And Frank Moser later as well. Oh, you may be wondering how could he fire them if it's technically their company. See, Keith Alby would actually sell their part of the company to Amity when Keith Alby formed with FBO under RCA to become RKO. So basically, Amity was his boss. And what he said went. Paul Terry was out. Don't worry. We'll see him again. Now, Amity was left with the Fables series to himself. No Farmer Alfalfa, which was Paul's to begin with, Amity had to strive on. But the 1930s would be a whole different ballgame. A time where Amity's will will be tested to its end. With Paul Terry gone from Fables Pictures, Amity had to carry on, and as we know by now, considering you either already know or been watching the series up to this point, competition was very heavy at the tail end of 1929, and so on. On top of that, another cartoon creation was reigning in the animation space, Mickey Mouse. So, how would Amity Van Buren prosper without Paul Terry at the helm? Well, the first move he would make was to put John Foster in his place. John would actually be a suitable replacement. See, he happened to also be animated in the same vein as Paul. His experience would include working with Raul Bari and later working on the Mutt and Jeff shorts. This was all due to his self-taught prowess. Speaking of prowess, he would take his seat at the helm starting with 1929's the Jungle Fool. This short would finally establish a cartoon star for them post Farmer Alfalfa, Milton Mouse. Now, if you are wondering if Milton Mouse bears any resemblance to another um, cartoon mouse, then you should know that someone else would make that same assumption Walt Disney. Let's go into this for a moment. There would be a huge controversy around Milton Mouse as he was seen as a direct ripoff of Mickey Mouse. But there is a case to be stated in Van Buren's favor. 
The truth is that Milton actually preceded Mickey Mouse by eight years. In fact, he would make his debut as a character in the aforementioned The Goose That Laid the Golden Egg. The character would appear in subsequent shorts after. Supposedly, Walt Disney had not only admired how quickly the Aesop fables were produced and released, but was also an avid viewer of the shorts as well. So being the young upstart Walt was at the time, he wanted to get in on the action. He, alongside Oob Iwerks, of course, would go on to create Oswald the Rabbit for Universal Studios. But later on, they would leave and make their own studio. Since Oswald would be the property of Universal, they had to come with another creation to drive the studio. That character would be none other than Mickey Mouse. They would create his first debut, Plain Crazy. Oh, let me reiterate. See, Steamboat Willie would be the first synchronized sound appearance of Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse would actually make his debut as a sign character in Plain Crazy. This short wasn't the biggest success, but it did warrant the second outing, the Gallopin Gaucho. This would be the short that would establish his iconic look. This would also be the catalyst for Disney's copyright claim against Van Buren. Despite Milton existed first, Disney would claim that Milton would bear traits similar to Mickey. What you have to understand is that after the reception of Steamboat Willie, Disney was shot to the forefront of the animation industry. In other words, Mickey Mouse was the hottest commodity. He would even manage to put a dent in Felix the Cat's reign by this point. He did have a case because the character would start to resemble Mickey with each appearance of Milton, including 1929's A Close Call, and so on up until 1931. Long story short, the verdict would lean in Disney's favor. And little did Van Buren know, Disney would later manage to win another way. But we'll get to that soon enough. Amity wouldn't let that deter the production of the Aesop Sound Fables series. Far from it. The series was going quite strong during early 1930s. In fact, they would become even more popular than Paul Terry's run at the studio. But in turn, the studio started to chase the success that Disney had. You can imagine that this would affect the quality of the tunes, and that's what happened. Nevertheless, the audience would grant them reprieve, and they would continue on. Speaking of that, the studio would introduce a new cartoon duo by the name of Waffles the Cat and Dawn Dog, starting with 1930's The Haunted Ship. The Waffles and Dawn Dog shorts would be a marginal success for the studio and they wanted to follow up on it with something to please RKO. Considering Amity had lost one of his live action series, Floyd Gibbons' Supreme Thrills. In 1931, they would do just that with a duo by the name of Tom and Jerry. Yes, there would also be a duo with the same namesake as Hanna-Barbera's iconic cat and mouse duo. But this Tom and Jerry duo wouldn't bear any resemblance to them. Instead, they would mostly be human counterparts of Waffles and Dawn Dog, even down to the formula of the character design, with Tom being the tall one and Jerry being the short one. Supposedly, they were inspired by a stage comedy from 1821 that shared their namesake. Nevertheless, they would make their debut on August 1st with their first short, Water Night. In the short, the characters are established with Tom being the leader of sorts, despite him being a bit of a coward. And Jerry, just being cheerful and brave. Also in the shorts, we have the two titular characters trying to drive on a rainy night and stop at a haunted castle. The animation would be quite the looker, where everything in the world of the cartoon transformed, such as the train going through water on the train tracks, the cloud above the castle using its walls as a piano, and a car's wheels sneezing. It would definitely take cues from what Pat Sullivan Studios were doing at the time with the Felix the Cat shorts. 
The cartoons had once again become a marginal success, enough to warrant another one, Polar Pals, on October 2nd of that same year. The series would carry on into 1932 with shorts such as In the Bag and a short some consider their best, Pennsylvania. In this short, we have a great use of the intro where the characters actually move to the beat of the music. Also, it would greatly employ the use of rubber hose animation as the two titular characters dabbled around with a single pencil and a creative use of music as Jerry turns a line into a saxophone that spews notes which turns into ducks. John Foster and Vernon Stallings prowess is definitely on grand display here. It seemed that Van Buren had found something that could compete with the likes of Fleischer Studios and Disney at the time, but that would be far from the truth. By 1933, Disney and Fleischer Studios were the talk of the industry and Van Buren Studios would settle into a distant third spot, maybe even fourth. So to compete, the studio had to take drastic measures. They would create another cartoon character that would make its debut on February 10th, 1933. This character would be Cubby Bear with his debut opening night. Let's cut to the chase. That drastic measure Amity would take would be copying another character. See, the success of Disney's tunes was crushing for a lot of animation studios at the time. Excluding Flight Studios, of course. And everybody had a cartoon star. Van Buren need one since Tom and Jerry wasn't exactly the hit that was grabbing the audience's attention. So Amity's move was to copy Mickey Mouse once again. Mind you, this would be a time where Amity would actually fire John Foster in 1933 due to the lukewarm reception of the Tom and Jerry shorts. So he was grasping at straws here. So, would Cubby Bear be the success that Van Buren Studios needed? Well, the short answer would be no. But the long answer would be that, after that initial short, their follow-up, Love's Labor One, which was co-directed by John Foster before his departure, by the way, would show the cracks in the studio's output. The shorts would often repeat plots consistent. In the short, Cubby and his girlfriend would sing and dance, and Cubby ultimately ends up trying to save Honey from a villain. The shorts would still continue on until 1933. During that time, the studio would also gain assistance from two of the best animes at the time, Rudolph Issing and Hugh Harmon, with a slew of cubby cartoons, including World Flight and The Gay Gacho. As you know from this duo at the time, they would come fresh off being at Warner Brothers Studios. So in other words, Cubby Bear would start to resemble what they wanted the character to be. And the character would be a creation of theirs that brought them to the top, Bosco. Sight gags and rhythmic movement of the character was obvious to those who viewed them. On top of having the Cubby Bear, Tom and Jerry, and the long running series Aesop Sound Fables, the studio would churn out another creation, The Little King. Now, this one would be quite different from every other cartoon Van Buren Studios had done up to this point. It would actually be an adaption from a comic strip from magazine illustrator. Otto Soglo. Around this time, you had many comic and kid strips in the papers. It seemed that every studio were dipping their hands in the water to adapt them. The most famous of them all, Popeye would make an appearance that same year and became a successful Fleischer. So at the behest of his staff, Van Buren would take a crack at it with releasing the first official Little King short, The Fatal Note. Here, the audience would get to see the character in animation. The Little King would be quite the character. It would use the same tall, short dynamic as the King was a short, bell-shaped man who never took off his crown and stood alongside his tall queen as she indulged in the simplicities of life, such as sharing her lunch with a peasant. The King was quite childish in nature. It was a stark contrast to every Van Buren short that preceded. You know what else was? The 
quality of the animation as well. The staff would create some of the best of that era. But alas, that wouldn't spell success. It would only last 10 cartoons in total. Not because it wasn't a success. It was due to George Stallings, longtime animator at Van Buren departing from the company. So with John Foster and George Stallings, who would take his place? You should know him by now from watching the series. George's replacement would be none other than Burt Gillen. Oh, we will get to his contribution at the studio shortly. 1934 would unfortunately see the end of the Aesop Sound Fable series, which concluded with Cubby Bear, by the way. This would be a huge blow to the studio, but the fact is that the Aesop Sound Fables had became stale. You have to remember, this was a time where you had characters like Mickey Mouse at the forefront. And let's be frank, most of the Aesop Sound Fables, Amos and Andy, and the Lil' King weren't the most accessible to a general audience, with constant references to bootleg liquor and crudeness. Besides, this would be beyond their control due to a legislation that would be passed down that year, the Hayes Code. This very mandate made every studio change the way they presented content. So Van Buren was faced with a dilemma, and he had to conjure up a way to stay in the race. With Vernon Stallings gone, he had an idea. Bring on a man that was making his competition strive. That man would be Bert Gillen. Told you I would get to him. Now, Bert would be quite different to what Amity Van Buren was used to. Before we get into that, first, we have to know the man himself to understand. See, Bert is a man who got his start working as a newspaper cartoonist and would get into the animation industry by 1916. He would go on to work on the Mutt and Jeff series and later work with Max Fleischer. He would also later go on to work with Pat Sullivan Studios and of course work on the Felix the Cat cartoons for a very long time. He would then leave to go off to join Walt Disney in 1929. There, he would do great things at Disney including directing 1932's Disney's Technicolor effort, Flowers and Trees, which won an Academy Award. Their first, by the way. And his follow-up in 1933, The Three Little Pigs, which would be a huge hit in theaters that year. Burt was a key figure under Disney's umbrella, so Van Buren wanted that for himself. But there was a price for having Burt on board. See, Burt did things a certain way. He would develop a certain style that would be unlike anything seen at Van Buren. Burt sought to recreate the studio in his image. That meant getting newer equipment and using techniques that the staff were not experienced at. Nevertheless, he would conjure up the Tottle Tales and the Rainbow Parade series. So, how would these two series do in the grand scheme of things? Well, first off, since the change to Technicolor, this meant that they couldn't pump out as much cartoons as they wanted to. By 1933, they had only done 33 in total. Mind you, the studio had done 83 Aesop Fable shorts in the span of two years. Why I said that is because the order would be shorted in 1934 with only 19 ever released. On top of that, Bert wasn't exactly a pleasure to work with. In fact, many of the staff hated him due to his overbearing nature, his bipolar behavior that heightened even more through excessive drinking as well. But that didn't matter to a man like Amity. He was a man who only cared about results. But there was one problem with that. The results weren't good. Let's start with Tottle Tales, which strangely would be in black and white. It would make its debut with 1929's The Grandfather's Clock. Long story short, let's just say that Burt Gillett's focus weren't on these cartoons. Supposedly, these were only made to fulfill Van Buren's contract with RKO, and it showed. They were slapdash together with live action scenes. 
there would only be three in total, with the third entry, 1935's Picnic Panic being the most well received. As for the Rainbow Parade series, things would fare a little better. With this cartoon, they would bring on a man by the name of Ted Eshbaugh. He would be quite the experienced animator for them, as his forte would be working in Cinecolor. As for the cartoon itself, it wouldn't have too much of a plot outside of a chef baking a cake for a wedding. This would be one of three Eshbar efforts with, with Sunshine Makers and Japanese Lanterns being the second and third respectively. At the same time, Bert would try to make a character, or should I say characters, that could be the next star for Van Buren Studios with 1934's The Parrotville Fire Department. The cartoon would feature three parrots as the stars. They wouldn't be a perfect fit for the big screen as the audience wouldn't gravitate to them. The two follow-ups, Parrotville Old Folks and Parrotville wouldn't bode well either. But you know what would do better instead? One particular cow by the name of Molly. Molly Moo Cow, that is. She would make her debut in 1935 with her first short, The Hunting Season. But it wouldn't be this cartoon that would make her a hit. But it wouldn't only be this cartoon that would make her a hit, but also plant the seeds for an emerging technology that was starting to gain steam at the time. Technicolor. Molly Moo Cow would benefit from it the most as Burton went crazy with the color technology. He made sure that everyone knew that it was his choice. The cartoons were such a marvel that most vendors only wanted the Molly Moo cartoons. But this technical marvel would come at the expense of the staff. See, Burt was quite the slave driver to say the least. In fact, it had gone so bad he would actually threaten his staff that didn't comply with his demands. On top of that, the cartoons started to go over their budget. But this wasn't a concern for Van Buren because for all he was concerned, the cartoons were starting to become a success and the results were too good for him to pass up. This in turn made Bert's ego overswell. He would go on to try to acquire a property that could propel them past Disney. That property would be none other than Felix the Cat. I already went into the history of Felix the Cat and how the character got to this point. So I suggest that you view those two episodes in tandem. Long story short, he would acquire Felix and reintroduce him to a new audience in 1936 with his Rainbow Parade debut, Felix the Cat and the Goose that Laid the Golden Eggs. In this cartoon, Felix would try to get a goose that laid golden eggs that is stolen by a pirate captain. The cartoon would be a moderate success, despite Felix unfortunately borrowing traits from Mickey Mouse. And it would garner him two more cartoons, Neptune Nonsense and Bold King Cole that same year. Despite the drastic character change, it would allow the Rainbow Parade series to carry on. That and Tunaville folks, another property that the studio would acquire. This one would fare decent, starting with 1936's Tunaville Trolley. This one would be quite different as it would emulate the source material really good. It starred a character by the name of the Skipper. It would be a marginal success, enough to warrant two follow-ups with Trolley Ahoy and Tunaville Panic. It seemed that Van Buren Studios had gotten a foothold as a viable cartoon studio. But alas, the wind would be knocked from Van Buren's sale. See, Disney would leave United Artists that same year, and guess who wanted to scoop him up? If you guessed RKO, you are absolutely correct. This made Van Buren finally come to a realization. He was never going to top Disney. It's one thing that Disney was competition from afar, but now with him also at RKO, he knew that the inevitable would come. So Van Buren did the best thing he could do in that situation. He would close the studio at the end of 
1936. That was it. The years of hard work. All of it gone. Disney had finally won the top spot in the animation space. Even though he would lose the animation side of the studio, he would continue on with live action shorts. But even those wouldn't keep him or his studio afloat. Times had started to change, and the projects weren't up to snuff anymore. By the end of 1937, Amity Van Buren and his studios would be a thing of the past as it closed down. Amity Van Buren would pass away a year later due to a heart attack in his home in the same town where he was born, Carmel, New York. That was it. A man who put every ounce of himself that he had, and now he was gone. So, we arrived to the conclusion, and of course, begs the question, what is Van Buren's legacy and relevancy in the animation space today? Well, it would be easy to say that his relevancy boils down to one man, Paul Terry, but that's not mostly the case. I will touch on Paul Terry's venture after his departure from Van Buren Studios in another episode entirely. As for Van Buren's true legacy, unfortunately, it can't be measured by the studio's body of work. Because truthfully, most of the general audience most likely haven't heard of the studio or his contribution to the animation industry. This most likely has to do with the lack of preservation of the shorts themselves. See, around the late 50s onto the 60s in particular, most studios were repackaging their shorts for television even going far as editing out unsavory parts for the general public. Unfortunately, Van Buren's output never really got the same treatment. Also, many of the Aesop fables has been lost over time, but there are many in the animation community that are just stumbling upon some of those lost shorts. Truthfully, Van Buren's legacy solely lies in the animators that worked for the studio. Without the studio, we might have never had the likes of Vernon Stallings, John Foster, or Paul Terry, of course. All three of them would manage to carve out a great spot in the industry. The studio even coaxed the likes of Burt Gillett, Harming, and Issing to join the studio. That's all fine and dandy, but what is Van Buren's relevancy today in the world of animation? Now, the answer to this is quite concrete. Remember when I previously mentioned Picnic Panic? Well, this short would be quite highly regarded among many animation fans and historians alike. Speaking of the former, one of those fans would be a person by the name of Maja Moldenhauer. So, who is Maja Moldenhauer? Well, this is where things get very interesting. She would lend her talent to a project that would invigorate excitement in one particular medium. Let me show you what it is. Here it is. What you see here is 2017's then Xbox One exclusive release, Cuphead. Yes, a video game. Created by two Canadian brothers by the name of Chad and Jared Moldenhauer. They had a pure love for video games and animation as they watched several cartoon shorts of the 1930s during their early years. This, in turn, would inspire them to combine their two loves and create their own studio, MDHR, to house their very first project. It would be a tale of two anthropomorphic teacups by the name of Cuphead, of course, and his brother Mugman. 
these two would get caught up in a misdealing with the evil one himself after losing at his casino. Why would they lose? Their souls. But he would make a deal with them. If they can collect all of his debts, he would free them from their contract. So this starts their mission. And guess who is the artist of this game? None other than Maja Moldenauer. See, Maja would stumble upon a short where anthropomorphic utensils frolicked around happily. It was quite the spectacle marvel. That short she saw, well, it would be none other than Picnic Panic. She would go on record to say that Picnic Panic was the inspiration for the characters of Cuphead and Mugman. This would be a very, very good inspiration indeed because Cuphead would sell over a million copies upon two weeks of its release. It wowed many game publications, critics, and fans alike. This was due to the hardcore gameplay, but the ultimate draw would be the art style that would have made Paul Terry and Max Fleischer blush to say the least. If that wasn't enough, this would allow the Molden Howard brothers to venture into another medium. Like they say, Art begets art. We're looking for fun. Here it is, the Cuphead Show. This would be a partnership with, get this, King's Features Syndicate and Netflix. Yes, that very same King's Features that had the hands in the 1960s Popeye's Syndicate series. They would help bring the duo to a realm that inspired their creation in the first place the animation space, in their own misadventures. Even though the reviews were quite mixed with some being disappointed that it didn't follow the game's themes and feel as it skewed towards the younger audience, which was the right choice by the way, Netflix has greenlit another season, so more misadventures await the porcelain duo. Besides, gamers aren't left out to dry as of June of this year, or 2022 depending on when you watch this episode studio mdhr will release the long-awaited dlc expansion to cuphead called the delicious last course if this isn't relevancy on van buren's part then i don't know what is all in all the point is that when you create art someone will always find some inspiration from it no matter how lost or scarce it is, art will always find its way to those who seek it. That's if the art itself is timeless. That's really the gist of Van Buren's legacy and relevancy. Amity was a man who started out just wanting to be a part of the business and wanted to give the audience something to watch. Quality wasn't always a concern to him. Just as long as people watched it, that's all that mattered. But he managed to do more than that. Despite the studio's output not being well known or highly regarded like Fleischer Studios, Pat Sullivan Studios, and Disney of course, he still managed to carve out a decent spot at the infancy of the industry. I can't imagine as he passed away, he probably wondered if he really did make something memorable or worthwhile or would he even be remembered for generations to come. On his behalf, let's put that notion to rest. There are many places where his efforts can be viewed for all to see. Many cartoon historians are out there making sure that his studio's work isn't forgotten. His legacy lies there. If I could personally tell Amity one thing, it would go like this. Dear Amity, your place in animation history will prevail. And yeah, Disney's still around. Thank you all for watching. 
I would like to humbly apologize for taking so long with the episode. I just wanted to make sure that I got everything right. I take pride in that. I respect your time in viewing the content. Van Buren was quite the interesting studio. I thought I wouldn't have nothing to say about the studio, but it happened to be more than I ever bargained for. I truly believed that the studio should be highlighted publicly in its rightful place among its peers in film and animation history. Oh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. I do this for you, the patron. It's my passion to bring this content to you all. If you like the video, please press that thumbs up and share the content with others as well. It would be greatly appreciated as it helps the channel as well. I want to continue on with my mission to curate the animation experience. Also, be on the lookout for the next episode. This one is going to be a huge one indeed. I can't wait for you all to view it. With that said, this is where I have to bid you all farewell. Please come back as we delve into another piece of animation history throughout the gallery on the next episode of The Cartoon Curator. Till then, Godspeed.